Well, welcome. Thank you all so much for being here. Again, you're at First Thursdays uh, with Sustainable Tulsa. And today's topic is, it is okay to talk climate in Oklahoma, presented by Brad Carl with the Nature Conservancy of Oklahoma. Thank you so much. We're so uh, looking forward to Brad's presentation. And definitely, I'm sure uh, that um, subject line caught many of your eyes. Uh, as it's been a conversation uh, for some time now. But uh, before we get started, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us today. And of course, we hope each of you are staying safe and healthy uh, and uh, taking care of yourself and your families. Um, thank you for making the time to join us online. Uh, even though I'm sure people are fatigued and this may be your third uh, time to uh, be in a virtual environment, we're glad you've joined us today. Um, I also want to uh, say that our, our team has been working hard to keep you connected online through social media. And of course, First Thursdays, our B2B Case for Sustainability series. We'll have some scorecard work days coming up and, and our Oklahoma Green Living play, page. So we're planning on an exciting 2021 and, and we hope to have that include some outdoor socially distanced events as well. Uh, so stay tuned uh, to how we can um, move into hopefully a hybrid uh, experience uh, and sometime in uh, 2021. But uh, I also wanna thank our program sponsors. Our lead sponsor is Williams. They came a new sponsor just recently. Thank you Williams for your uh, lead sponsor support to First Thursdays. Um, and we also wanna thank our other sponsors as well, uh, Public Service uh, Company of Oklahoma, American Waste Control, Cavanta, The Met, One Oak, Save Our Streams, Spirit Air Systems, TCC McKeon Center for Creativity, and PSO Wind Choice. Uh, please give them a virtual round of applause. Uh, we truly could not do this program without their support and of course, without your support joining us. So thank you so much to our sponsors. I also wanna thank uh, my board members. Uh, give a wave uh, when I um, say your name, but a thank you to our board uh, members that have joined us today and their leadership in 2020 and helping us plan for a great 2021. Uh, Stephanie Cameron, Rick Katarski, Nadia Kirilova, Aaron Larder, Mike Lemus, Carrie Rowland, Mike Teague, Pam Taylor, and James Williams. Thank you. Give them a round of applause because they really have just been so amazing to support um, the work we're doing and helping helping us plan for, for more in 2021. Um, also wanna um, uh, thank my team, uh, my Sustainable Tulsa team, uh, Jill Maud, our office, office specialist, Megan Hurley, our marketing and events manager, and our new scorecard manager, Teresa Kerrigan. And I think we've got a picture there. Uh, we wanna welcome uh, her giveaway, Teresa. Uh, she's gonna be taking your questions today, but you're gonna get to, to meet her uh, more and more over the next couple of weeks, but we're thrilled she just joined the team. This is her fourth day. So um, if you can stick around uh, later today and welcome her, we would um, like for you to do that if you have the time to do that. So uh, welcome, Teresa. We're looking forward um, to your addition to our team. Um, so, uh, okay, more information. So Samuel Tulsa is continuing to make a positive impact in our community, but now more than ever, as you, as you know, nonprofits are working uh, hard to, to keep their efforts going and so is Sustainable Tulsa. So any donation can make a difference. In fact, uh, with a donation of just $25, you can be listed uh, your name and as a supporter of our Oklahoma Green Living page. We'd love to see that list grow. Uh, that tells the rest of our community how important these green living practices are. So please, if you haven't supported us or if you wanna sponsor someone else and you've already supported the page, we'd love to have uh, you'd be a part of that. And so take a look. I think uh, uh, we'll put that there in the chat for you, how you can make that happen. We also have our program, our November Business to Business Case for Sustainability Series. That is uh, our, and we will be featuring our 2020 Bauman Awards winner panel. Uh, the 2020 winners this year, as you've seen on social media and in the blast for the invite for the B2B Case for Sustainability Series is the Metropolitan Environmental Trust is our micro business category, City of Tulsa Water and Sewer, Elwood location in the small business category, Muskogee Creek Nation, and the medium business category, Aon and the large business category and Spirit Era Systems as our overall Bellman Award winner this year. Please give them a round of applause right now and also join them and um, the rest of our scorecard members and business members at our upcoming B2B Case for Sustainability event. It will be held next week online, Thursday, November 12th 
at eight o'clock. And um, I think Megan will post in there uh, a link uh, so that you can get registered. We'd love to see you there. Um, okay, uh, our last first Thursday of 2020 will be on Thursday, November 3rd. And while the pandemic has changed some of our plans this year, uh, we are happy to announce we are collaborating with the Oklahoma Food Bank for one more um, event. And we'll have two volunteer opportunities that day on December 3rd, in addition to our viral event. Uh, we'll be talking with uh, the Food Bank, but also we'll have a couple other speakers talking about green gifts and other ways to kind of navigate this holiday season. Uh, more information will be posted soon on our website, so stay tuned. And if you'd like to volunteer, please reach out to Megan via chat and send her an email uh, and let her know that you're interested and because uh, those volunteer spots are limited, of course. So uh, reach out to her if you'd like to be a part of um, making Tulsa a better place uh, through uh, volunteering with the food bank. Um, but before we get started, I want to hand it back over to Megan for a virtual boots updates. So Megan. Thank you, Corey. Uh, we have uh, PSO, one of our uh, sponsors for thir First Thursday. I'm not sure if Carrie is with us today uh, yet. I know she's planning on it, but uh, PSO is, uh, uh, has a pilot program, the Energy Star Benchmarking. Uh, I believe she talked to us about it a little bit last month, uh, but if you would like more information about PSO, which is one of our major energy providers in uh, the Tulsa area, uh, PSO also has PSO Win Choice program, another sponsor for First Thursday. Sign up for Win Choice. It's a great program and it helps us bring more wind energy into Oklahoma. Uh, so for more information about PSO, we can put that information in the, the chat as well. Our next sponsor is, uh, we have uh, American Waste Control. I'm not sure if I saw Jessica on here yet or not. Um, but uh, Amanda Curtis and Jessica Gulo are with uh, American Waste Control. They, uh, I, if you recycle in Tulsa County, uh, they are your recycling company. They're fantastic. They also do wood recycling now as well. If you'd like more information about uh, their recycling programs, please reach out to Amanda Curtis at amanda at awcok.com. And then Allie with the Met, are you on? You've got some programs. Hey, yeah. Yes, sure, we've yeah. got yeah, we've got a couple of uh, collection events coming up. So our first one, that's the whole month of November, is going to be our Great Pumpkin Rescue, and you can bring your old jack o' lanterns, pumpkins, gourds, anything that you use for decorations for Halloween, to uh, six of our different locations. And then coming up this Saturday, we have a fire extinguisher and smoke alarm collection event, and it's going to be at the Lowe's of South Tulsa from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. And then finally, after Thanksgiving, if you do those deep fried turkeys, we have a <laughs> fryer oil event taking place where we'll collect that old fryer oil for you. That is really cool. Thank you so much. I, I did not know you did that. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. And then uh, City of Tulsa Save Our Streams program. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, education program uh, run by Dustin Jaggers. If you'd like more information, go to cityoftulsa.org backslash SOS. And our last sponsor of the day is TCC. Uh, of course, if we were in person, this is what we would, we would be over at TCC hugging each other and we'll one day be doing that again. But of course, uh, TCC has some excellent sustainability programs. I know I, Mike Lemus was instrumental in a lot of that and the team over there, Cindy, uh, both Cindy's, uh, Armstrong and Shanks, uh, fantastic program. So thank you guys over at TCC. Corey, back to you. Hey, thank you, Megan, and all those great opportunities to uh, act sustainably in the Tulsa area. We appreciate each of the organizations and what they offer. So thank you so much for those updates. Uh, I'm delighted to in, uh, invite and introduce Brad Carl. Um, what a jewel of the Oklahoma community. Since December 2019, Brad has worked as the external affairs and climate specialist with the Nature Conservancy of Oklahoma, an Emmy Award winner, 
Over the past eight years, he has worked as a certified broadcast meteorologist and reporter covering severe storms, devastating flooding, extreme weather, and climate issues in Montana and um, Arkansas and Oklahoma. Um, also, uh, sorry, I just lost that. Um, also, Brad is also a uh, lead award-winning sustainability team member while at Fox 23 News in Tulsa uh, that he helped to reduce garbage output by more than 60%, wow, in less than two years. He's helped to develop the Nature Conservancy of Oklahoma's approach on climate messaging and policy and has also successfully lobbied for conservation issues with the Oklahoma's congressional delegation. Wow, uh, we are just so thrilled to have you here today, Brad. Thank you so much. And we look forward to hearing what you have to say and share with us today. Brad, Carl. Thank you very much for that introduction, Corey. Um, very, very happy to be here. Thank you so much for all of you taking time out of your day to come on, listen about climate. You know, if only there was nothing else possibly going on in the world that you might be focused or, or looking into, you know, right now um, that might otherwise distract you. Um, but no, it, definitely appreciate you all being on and, and coming on to hear about what we've been learning about when it comes to climate messaging and how we even begin to unpack this issue, this important issue uh, within our state. So quickly, first off, just a little bit about me for those of you who don't know me. Uh, I used to be in Tulsa, now down the other side of the Turnpike in Oklahoma City and miss aspects of Tulsa very dearly. Uh, but spent uh, eight plus years as a broadcast meteorologist uh, in Billings, Montana, Fayetteville, Arkansas, and most recently uh, in Tulsa at Fox 23. You can see me there um, when I actually had to shave a little bit more and that, that I don't miss. I like being able to be a little scruffier when I want to and not have to worry about what consultants think about it. It is a beautiful thing. Um, but I had a chance to cover severe weather, flooding, sustainability, and climate issues and start to kind of, you know, creep that door open a little bit in terms of sustainability and climate and, and get an idea for how you even might begin to talk about that uh, within the states. So it was really cool to, to kind of dive into that a little bit more. And now I have since transitioned to working for the Nature Conservancy uh, as the external affairs and climate specialist. And for a quick little dive into what TNC does exactly, um, we are the oldest and largest, or at least one of the oldest and largest uh, environmental and conservation focused nonprofits in the world founded in 1951. Uh, what does set us apart is that we are strictly nonpartisan. We work with everyone uh, across the aisle, different uh, companies, different sectors, kind of bring everyone together. We are very much into collaboration. That is very much our bread and butter. Uh, and on top of that, also are very much involved with uh, managing and doing actual conservation work in the field. We have our team of staff uh, across the state, across the world, who are actually doing a lot of that work, like out boots on the ground, which is really cool. Here in Oklahoma, we have more than 100,000 acres that we help to manage, including the tall grass prairie preserve up by uh, Pawhuska. Have you ever been? It's a beautiful wonderful, wonderful spot, uh, not too far from Tulsa to get a chance to go check it out. But across the world, uh, we protect uh, some 125 million acres. So we're in addition to doing a lot with conservation, talking about the importance of those kind of policies, we also, and in very much way, this is how we were founded, we do a lot of land protection, including right here within Oklahoma. So now that we're kind of peeling back, you know, going into some of the priorities of what the Nature Conservancy is doing, one of those priorities is tackling climate change, which makes a lot of sense because how can we engage in conservation work and protecting the environment if things are changing? We have to figure out kind of what that is and also to best mitigate uh, and prep for it. So we're very much a science-based organization. That's very, very critical to everything that TNC does. And science is very, very clearly telling us that climate change is indeed a serious threat. It's driving extreme weather events, uh, it's causing economic instability and harming our environment at large. So boiling that down then to the Oklahoma level, what do we need to do with that? With the understanding that what we need to do is very, very different and the approach is very different than what places say on our, our, our coast might need to do. New York and California and Washington state are gonna be at a very, very different uh, level of talking about this issue than we are. And that's totally okay. But that also kind of gives us an idea of what our objectives are. And we're still at that point. Where we have to talk about the narrative. We have to improve that narrative within Oklahoma. We're not quite at that point to be able to talk about it more openly. We're just starting to. And we're, we're kind of inching along that way. We're going in a good direction. But we still have to work on improving that narrative. Nothing else can come before that. 
So we're doing that by identifying the commonalities, challenges, opportunities, not just with a little group of uh, folks involved in environmental and conservation and sustainability, but really casting the net out wide by getting a lot of people's buy-in and feedback so that if we at some point, not if, when we come out at some point and say, well, this is what we think we should do on climate change, it's not, it's not been hatched in a bubble. It's because we've gotten a lot of people's feedback and have a good idea of what that could really look like within our state. So the idea is we kind of have to transform this conversation. We have to go from what is kind of feels like this at times toxic and prickly food fight, uh, which I don't think we're at this point anymore. I really, really don't. I'm optimistic to say we're kind of in between that and where we got over here on the right. This idea that we can work together with a diverse group of people and figure out what exactly talking about climate and doing something about climate change would look like in Oklahoma. But we still have to transform that conversation to a degree. We're not on that right side just yet. But how do we get there? We have to listen. That, that is the most important part. We have to listen, which is why we had these climate listening sessions that we launched back in February and have been conducting this conversation since then. We'll talk more about that here in a second. But before we hop into that a whole lot, uh, to make this interactive, to make this interesting, I want you to try something for me. So this is, this is a uh, participation sport, participation uh, kind, of, kind of talk here with Sustainable Tulsa. So what I want you to do is we're gonna use a virtual whiteboard. And how you're gonna do that is I want you to scroll up to the top of your screen. You'll see a, a thing that says view options. Go ahead and click that then select the pencil that has the word annotate underneath it, and then select the T for text, which will be on the left side of your screen. I know I just, just uh, blabbed out a bunch of directions all at you at once. That's why I've got them up on your screen for you to view yourself to go ahead and give a shot. So go ahead and try doing that. If for whatever reason you're having too much trouble before you start banging your head against the wall, just toss it in the chat instead. We're just choosing path of least resistance. So whatever works best for you, um, but would love to hear if, if you can get this to work, the one to two words that come to your mind when you think of climate change. We'll, we'll spend a good minute, maybe two, just looking at this. Just out of curiosity's sake. So we've got changing plants and growing, global warming, Doom, destruction, can't ignore, flooding, extreme storms, weather events, invasive species, melting ice, habitat loss, greenhouse gas, danger, fires. So you're noticing even in our, you know, fairly concentrated group of, of people who all care about sustainability, we got answers kind of all over the place, as to be expected. Adaptation polar bears, what our kids will have to deal with, completely solvable problem, I like that one. Care can be fixed, okay. Getting some good feedback here, I love this. Natural cycle, opportunity, sea level rise, water issues, sure. Unpredictable weather patterns. All right, I'll give you another 30 seconds to add in whatever you think. I think a lot of you have done that. It looks like we have several people putting in the chat as well. Very, very cool. Okay, hoax, teamwork, extinction. Some people are adding arrows now to, to point ones they really agree with. That's cool too. Changing plants and growing. Okay. Human need for education. So I mean, even just looking at our group here, of, I think we've got about 70 or so people on this. I mean, we have a lot of different thoughts on this topic. So how on earth are we gonna try to agree if we're kind of all over the place? It's kind of fun. So what I'm gonna do now, we're gonna go on to the next slide and erase everyone's stuff. So Larissa, um, my coworker is gonna take a little snapshot of that just to kind of see what people are at. Just interesting to see, um, you know, take the temperature, see where people kind of are at with this, uh, with this issue. So let's move on and I'm gonna go ahead and remove uh, the annotations here. So one second, there we go. Clear all drawings. All right, time's up, no more annotating. All right. 
So moving on. So where do we agree on climate change? Because as you saw from even just this group trying to talk about it, we are all over the place. So these conversations that we are hosting, we're really trying to find this idea of where messaging wise, policy wise, priorities wise, there might be some paths of agreement. What avenues might we be able to go down that we actually all agree on, even though we all come from very different backgrounds, different fields, different companies, different industries. Um, what are all the common threads that all these very specifically Oklahoma-based groups can come together on with this idea that this narrative here in Oklahoma cannot be from California, cannot be from New York, cannot be from Florida. It has to be uniquely ours, which is why we had to really take that sampling here within the state. So to give you an idea of who we talked to and prove that you know this was not just hatched in our own little corner, here's some of the groups that we that we talked to uh, about this. I'm gonna go ahead and one last annotation there. There we go, I think. I'm not sure why that one's still showing up. Clear viewers drawing. There we go. Now I figured it out. Yay, technology. All right. So with all these various climate listening sessions, I mean, these are all the various groups that we talk to. So everyone from state agencies, the oil and gas sector, faith groups, the utility sector, um, farmers, ranchers, and the agriculture sector, broadcast meteorologists. I mean, really a wide swath. And that was the whole idea of we got to take it, if we're going to go ahead and get an idea of what does this conversation look like across the state, we really have to kind of peek into all these uh, various wells and see where, what exactly people are at. Um, overall, we had about 180 different individuals who have participated on, on these uh, listening sessions with the Nature Conservancy so far. We have a couple more we're still trying to do to kind of fill out a, a couple more of these a bit more, but overall, we're, we're getting a really good idea for themes already, which is why we're comfortable enough sharing with you kind of what we've learned. What I'm not telling you right now, and this may be frustrating to some of you, I'm not telling you which state agency, I'm not telling you which tribes, not saying which broadcast meteorologist. And, Although I understand the frustration there, we also made a deal with many of these groups saying, you know, we understand this is an uncomfortable topic for many of you. Even just getting you to come on and talk to us for an hour is like having a Band-Aid slowly ripped off. I get it. So the deal was, we're, we're not going to go ahead and release anything publicly about your specific involvement unless we have your explicit permission. And so we're not at that point yet. We may not be at that point yet. We're still trying to kind of figure out if that's something we want to release fully or they have something that we just keep internally and then share the data. So this is still kind of an ongoing conversation, but right now we're just comfortable telling you what kind of sectors they're in without giving you actual specifics. That being said, the findings that we're gonna to share today, I don't think are all that controversial, but are still very interesting. So that's kind of in a nutshell where we're at with these conversations, but a lot of different people from a lot of different sectors was kind of the important thing. One of the conversations, the way we got conversations started um, was through this fantastic resource from the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication, um, which if you have not explored this in the past is absolutely wonderful. Um, I have Larissa, my coworker, is gonna drop the link to this uh, in the chat. And I believe the follow-up email from this call will also have the link to this if you wanna go explore it after we're done. Uh, you could easily spend a couple hours digging into all this stuff. Really, really fascinating. Um, to look into a combination of polling data as well as some uh, data extrapolation based on more localized polling data, that things like that, of where we might be in the state in terms of talking about this issue um, with kind of a whole slew of different aspects talking about climate change. Um, as we certainly know, polling is not gospel, it ain't perfect, um, but could give us a glimpse in terms of where we are in our state with certain aspects. So really cool resource, many of the climate listening session participants have said they've utilized this and sharing it widely uh, because they, they think it's, it's a really useful thing to have. So I highly recommend you look into it as well. Okay, but enough about the lead up to that. The reason why you are on this call is because you want to hear what we found out. So drum roll, please. What did we find out? There are three major takeaways that we got from this identified at least uh, so far. I'm going to go ahead and remove annotations. There we go. Not sure why those keep popping up. All right. So as far as the major takeaways, let's go through them. So number one, what have we learned? Climate resiliency seems to be a universally positive theme participants can get behind. Now, what do we mean by that? I mean this as the ability to anticipate, prepare for, and respond to hazardous events, trends, or disturbances related to climate. This idea that we can adapt and we can get through this crisis by by being able to uh, kind of hop in 
and and you know look at solutions and ways that we can adapt and mitigate. That's basically kind of what I mean by that. So as far as the details as we start looking into what exactly is climate resiliency and why why is it seem to be such a good thing in Oklahoma, in my opinion, it's already baked into the DNA. This is something that we we already have going for us. Uh, if you if you think you know in terms of going back to the Dust Bowl, we're going to talk about here in a second. This is some this is what got us out of the Dust Bowl. It was resiliency. It was us you know going through the mud and the dirt and the dust and figuring out okay what do we have to change, and there aren't a whole lot of other states out there that have something that concrete and that tangible to say man we got through a a serious point in our history where the land literally turned against us and the climate really had turned against us in a different realm than kind of the bigger climate change that we're seeing more on a much larger scale now. So let's talk about the Dust Bowl and kind of how that plays into resiliency. So in the Dust Bowl, um, you know, we had big, big problems. Um, this, for example, this is a shot from Hooker, Oklahoma, June 4th, 1937, of a big old dust storm approaching. And it wasn't like they had one of these. They had many of them. In fact, in 1938, the worst year, there were 61 dust storms alone documented in the Dust Bowl. If you can imagine dealing with that uh, so many different times over the span of 10 different years, um, just dark and scary on the horizon and moves through and puts plenty of dust down and everything, just kind of awful and terrible. Uh, thousands lost their lives from dust and pneumonia and some 400,000 people left the Great Plains as a result of the disaster. So this was really, really impactful, but we changed our ways. We adapted. We found ways through this. Congress passed the Soil Conservation Act that allowed us to start to get an idea of what kind of science we would need in order to adapt and make sure this wouldn't happen again. Um, we started using rotating crops, cover crops, and buffer zones as ways to kind of help mitigate things. And innovation allows to find better techniques for sustainable farming. We didn't know at the time that this, the way we were farming was harmful and that was setting us up for this. Um, also, kind of going back into a lot of the, the research and, and data and such, um, we, science has told us that, yes, there was a natural component to, to what was going on with, with the Dust Bowl, but much of this, in terms of all the dust and whatnot, was because of soil erosion, and that was very much caused by man and poor farming practices at the time. What's cool about this, and tying it back up to this number one point of of this idea of climate resiliency is, is a good thing and seems generally a positive thing. Um, there's this aspect of, of natural climate solutions. So what I mean by that is actually using the land to help us do a lot of the work to help uh, fight climate change. So to give you an idea what all that would kind of entail and how much work it could do, in the US, nature has the potential to remove 21% of the nation's carbon pollution. That's a lot. That's a, that's a good old chunk of the carbon pollution that we put out. It's not everything, but it's a pretty sizable tool in the toolbox. Um, and then through improved agriculture alone, which of course we have a lot of agriculture here within our state, be the equivalent of taking 85 million cars off the road. So now looking at that figure on the left, in terms of how much work, uh, you know, in terms of climate mitigation, you know, could do, um, yes, we see a lot with forests, which, hey, we are all for planting trees. Trees are good, certainly, you know, soak up a lot of carbon. And it is the quote unquote sexier uh, option just because it's seen like trees are green. We love trees and it's great. Very, very easy lift. People very much like that. But let's not forget that improved agriculture and improved land uh, management on grasslands can also do a large chunk of the work, uh, particularly here in Oklahoma, where we have a lot of agriculture and grasslands for us to work with. Oklahoma also ranks 11th as far as impact goes in improved agricultural practices that could help to sequester carbon. And when we're talking about carbon sequestration, I mean literally absorbing CO2 and putting it into the ground um, where that's a good place for as opposed to the atmosphere. Because keep in mind, we don't have great big technology on this level to be able to suck carbon out of the atmosphere. I think it's coming in the next few decades. We'll probably see a lot more of that. Um, but right now, we don't have that. So at this point, this, this is kind of one of the better options that we have to work with. So, uh, and the fact that we're, we rank 11th is really exciting that we could do a lot. We can be part of that big climate solution um, here within Oklahoma. Takeaway number two, listening session participants were very concerned about threats from flooding, drought and extreme weather events, but don't necessarily know how those events connect to climate change. 
I can say as a former broadcast meteorologist that generally uh, your populace uh, in Oklahoma is very weather savvy. You could show people a radar map, be like, oh, look at this couplet, look at this hook echo, and people, oh, I totally know what you're talking about. Like, I know when I need to go generally take shelter and not be on my porch and watch tornadoes, you know, fly by my house. But when it comes to being climate savvy and understanding what climate is, not so much. Um, there's, I think there's a big, big disconnect there. Uh, and particularly in terms of what weather events may be more connected to climate. And that being said, let's, let's get this out of the way real quick. Uh, Oklahoma has always had periods of droughts and floods. Uh, in fact, uh, when, when it comes to describing our state, the best way I've heard it described is we're a drought state punctuated by periods of heavy rain, which is pretty spot on. Um, but here's, here's the rub. When climate change kind of enters, enters the mix, it can, quote, load the dice and make those extremes more frequent and long lasting. We have a lot of science to kind of be able to uh, back that up. So just kind of think of that kind of loading the dice that maybe we're, you know, with having more climate change, with having more in the way of uh, having more in the way of warmer temperatures maybe allows us to squeeze a lot more water out of the atmosphere uh, when it comes to heavier rain events or possibly allows droughts to last a lot longer. And that's hugely impactful, particularly within our state. And we know certain events are connected more to, uh, to climate change than others. Um, so for example, what you're seeing here is kind of a spectrum of, of what weather events, um, extreme weather events, do we know have a better correlation to climate change? And so you see everything from extreme cold to extreme heat, drought, severe convective storms, wildfires, extra tropical cyclones, your hurricanes and such, uh, extreme rainfall, kind of all that on this spectrum. And we have a very good idea on the extreme heat and extreme cold end. For example, we know that we are breaking warm temperature records in the US at three times the rate that we're breaking extreme cold temperature records. If the climate was balanced, those would be even or pretty close to even over a longer period of time. Right now, they're not. Warm temperatures are far in the lead. We are far more likely to break warm temperature records than cold at this point, which is why you see extreme cold in that higher end of the spectrum. Um, you know, drought and extreme rainfall are kind of up there as well. As we get lower, and really this should be even more spread out in terms of where the science is at in this, but we don't know as much when it comes to severe convective storms. By that, I mean like your actual severe storms we get here. So when we're thinking big hail, you know, severe storms that have a lot of wind in them. When it comes to tornadoes, we don't know a whole lot right now. This is very much a big area of ongoing research, but right now we don't have a super good idea of where that kind of lies. But it's this idea that on the issues that we do care about, particularly the drought and extreme rainfall, which we know are big issues in Oklahoma, there is a correlation to climate change, but people don't necessarily understand that. And it's not necessarily, it, it's not because people are, are ill-informed or, or whatever. It's, this is complicated. Climate is incredibly complicated. And getting that messaging and, and kind of that idea out there that certain weather events we know more about than others is tough. It just is. But we also know it's impactful. Um, this is a look at Oklahoma specific, uh, billion dollar disasters for weather and climate events. Uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, um, we were talking about roughly 10 over the span of a decade a billion dollar plus weather disasters. And this has been adjusted for inflation. So we're comparing apples to apples. In the 2000s, it jumped up to a little over 20. And the 2010s uh, jumped up to well above 25. So this is expensive too. And this is why, you know, when it comes to everyone from farmers and ranchers to those who are in the utility sector and elsewhere, um, you know, that's, that's causing a, a lot of problems uh, and certainly very expensive. Whoops, too late. But it can also feel, as, a, as an issue, climate change can feel too big, too worldly to tackle. It's a huge issue. And the question is, how do, how do I get to play a part in that? How does the little you know, dot that where I live on this planet get to help play a part? Uh, and the way I kind of think about that is when you hear about a lot of the common talking points around climate change impacts, sea level rise, polar ice caps melting, hurricane impacts, do those really impact Oklahoma? you should still be concerned about these. These are still very big issues. But a lot of times, more than not, you're going to get this perspective of, well, good thing I don't have beachfront property. I here, you know, living in a landlocked state, don't have to worry about that, um, which I don't think is the right way to think about it. But very often, you're going to run to, to that issue. So from what we've gathered and from overall, like, like just good experience with this, you have to talk about local impacts and solutions. And there is a high desire from our 
uh, participants of wanting to have more localized data. That's how this kind of ties into to point number two. Um, and I don't, we don't really have a site for that right now. I really, really, really wish we did. Um, that would actually spell out kind of what we can expect from climate change going forward within our state. So that's, a, that's big on my wish list. But everything from flooding and droughts to less frequent winter weather events. Uh, in Tulsa right now, we are dealing with the longest uh, snow drought uh, in history going back to 1900 since we had records. With the idea being Tulsa hasn't even made it up to uh, average snowfall amounts uh, since roughly about 2012, 2013. And at the longest stretch we've gone without getting up there. So that's something that people have started to notice that maybe we're not seeing as much snow as we did in the 70s, 80s, things like that. So what can we expect to see in Oklahoma as a result of climate change going forward? People curious about that. And also how can Oklahoma be part of the solutions? So all of a sudden we've turned this conversation on its head from talking about you know polar ice caps and polar bears and sea level rise, which are all very important but now we've connected to something that actually touches down here in Oklahoma. And I think that's really critical uh, as part of this conversation going forward. And takeaway number three, and this is, this is, this is one of my favorites. Uh, the great majority of groups that we interviewed, including in the energy sector, are actively discussing climate change and sustainability. And some of those folks are even developing plans and sharing with external audiences. Um, this whole process of, of talking more about climate change, I liken kind of to a coming out process and different groups, different you know entities are kind of at their own pace and you don't want to push someone out before they're ready. It's really important that people are able to do that on their own and you know, encourage them. But at the same time, we want to make sure that, that they're you know, able to go at, at kind of a, you know, a decent pace, um, but not forced out, which is one of the reasons why we're not listing you know, those folks who have, have spoken with us, because some of them aren't ready to announce to the world that, hey, by the way, we're talking about climate change. But what was, what was interesting, though, is this perception on the call so many times uh, of these various climate listening session calls of, well, we want to talk more about climate, but no one else wants to, or so few others are. And here I am having call after call after call after call, and everyone's saying this, not realizing that many of these other groups are already having this conversation. Um, so helping to kind of connect people is cool and actually happened on one call where this one group said, wait, we had no idea that you were talking about that up the turnpike. That's so cool. Let's keep chatting. Awesome. Very cool. But they wouldn't know unless they are part of this conversation. Um, other thing that gets brought up a lot of times too is, well, we're unsure about how to talk about this issue without ticking people off. We can, we can dig into that. We can figure out what are the better ways to approach this um, that are less prickly, that may you know, be able to resonate better, um, that don't trigger a torch and pitchfork army. And I have been talking about climate within our state now for several years, and I've never had a torch and pitchfork army come after me. So if that's any uh, help to you, then, then I'm happy to share it. On the plus side though, participants of the climate conversation has been getting much easier over the last couple of years, especially when the conversation is really, really coming along very quickly. Uh, certainly this year, there's a lot more attention on the topic and it does feel less uh, divisive than in the past. So that's definitely a good uh, thumbs up there for sure. Also another positive aspect, uh, more and more companies are embracing um, ESG, so uh, environmental and social governance reporting and sustainability plans, seeing a lot more of this being discussed. Uh, I love what the, what the Oklahoman uh, had to say about this just last month, uh, particularly when it comes to our energy sector. Uh, Oklahoma-based energy companies certainly don't have their heads in the sand when it comes to global warming. I don't think that would have been the conversation you know, 10, 20 years ago. Things are changing really quick. Uh, that article listed efforts by Devon, Chesapeake, Continental Resources, and Williams to reduce emissions as part of climate targets, uh, and that was all mentioned uh, in that article. Really cool to get a chance to go check it out. Um, also, on top of that, 90% uh, now of S&P 500 index companies have published sustainability reports uh, in 2019, which also some of that does include some climate targets in there too, which is an all-time high. So this issue is getting talked about a lot within the business sector. Um, even though I think a lot of that's coming externally, um, you know, Oklahoma's kind of having to adapt to that. Our business community is having to adapt and, and figure out how are they part of the conversation? How do they get to have a seat at the table and, and be part of these solutions kind of going forward? Because people want this the, and the market at this point really wants it too. So to recap, you know, here are kind of our, ma our three major takeaways. Climate resiliency is an agreeable, positive theme to unite around. Participants are concerned about extreme weather events, but don't necessarily know how those events connect to climate change. And the great majority of groups interviewed are actively discussing climate change and sustainability. And some of you might be saying, that's it? That's all you have to say? 
patience. <laughs> More is coming. We are literally at the tip of the iceberg. We are just starting to kind of dig into to some of this. So there's a lot more coming out of this, which is really exciting. Uh, but we still need more time to kind of unpack that data uh, and be able to get an idea of what this really looks like as we get ready for kind of our own next steps within the Nature Conservancy. So as far as what's next for us, we're going to be putting together how to talk climate sessions um, with the groups that have participated in these listening sessions with us, which I'm looking, looking forward to and kind of sharing some of those results more in depth than what I just shared with you here. Um, and we're expecting to launch our own statewide climate campaign on into this spring. So this is just beginning, just like an iceberg. Uh, you're only really seeing the, the, you know, the, the very tip of it right now. There's a lot more under the surface. There's a lot more to go. In the meantime, for those of you who are licking your chops saying, well, I want to talk about this now by all means, please go for it. Um, what I would recommend is you check out this uh, the latest iteration, which just came out a few weeks ago, um, from the Nature Conservancy, our Let's Talk Climate How-To Guide. And uh, Larissa will be uploading this in the chat right now. Um, what this delves into, though, isn't so much the facts and figures about climate change, because that you can get in a lot of other places. But this does go into a lot of the psychology in terms of how do you have some of those more difficult conversations about getting people to understand this is a big issue and they should be talking about it more and figuring out what solutions look like. And it's all backed by science in terms of showing what all psychologically works to have a conversation where you're not gonna so much win someone over maybe with facts and figures and graphs and whatnot, but you might win over their hearts. And that for many people is, is gonna be enough to help get that conversation started. And we certainly love to see more people talking about this issue. That's kind of the first step uh, to getting more people involved in uh, talking about climate change, particularly within our own state. So that's what I got. Uh, I know it's a lot of information and whatnot to go through, but I certainly hope you've enjoyed kind of getting a glimpse of what that might look like and some of those takeaways within our state. And I certainly appreciate all of you being part of this uh, really important uh, and certainly impactful conversation and hopefully see that there's a lot we can do within Oklahoma to advance this conversation and uh, be part of the solutions. Uh, I would love to, to hear any and all of your questions and certainly feel free to email me with any additional questions, comments, thoughts, complaints about the weather uh, at brad.carl at tnc.org. So thank you much for having me, Sustainable Tulsa. I hope I loved, uh, I got to be the first of your folks talking about climate change, but certainly hope I won't be the last. Thank you so much, Brad, appreciate. Uh, I know that this presentation is backed by months and months of conversations and research. So thank you for uh, sharing uh, those overall results. And, and to your point, it's it's a journey where we're not quite there, we're still in the process. So thank you for uh, sharing kind of where we are uh, on that journey and per your research and the conversations you're having. Uh, you know, there's a couple questions that are coming through and uh, so we wanna make sure we get to those. Um, I, I'd love to, you know, uh, as I'm, I'm looking through these questions to ask you, um, you know, what are some of the things that you would recommend right now? You know, if, if folks are wanting to have that conversation, maybe just with family, or maybe it is within their, uh, you know, where they're working, what, you know, or, you know, a colleague or something like that. You know, what are some, you know, top three tips that you would suggest in, in uh, starting to have that conversation where you think that might have, uh, be, might have a stress to it? Yeah, I think, you know, like I kind of said in that last little bit of kind of winning over, you know, hearts maybe over, over minds, you know, talk to people and meet them where they're at. And that's all kind of part of this, that whole breakdown from that that booklet, but I, I really believe that of, you know, talk to people where they're at. If you know that they're concerned about, you know, flooding, maybe they live in a floodplain or whatnot, and that's really been top of mind, you, you can start the conversation there. Um, you know, if someone's concerned about, uh, you know, drought, certainly we know certainly our agriculture folks, and, and in general across the state, water is precious. Uh, and so if you know folks who are really concerned about that, or they've had water issues and stuff in the past, um, that's a good place to meet them. Uh, it doesn't have to be, and I really don't think it should be kind of on this worldly stage. Like you're, you're, you're going to have a much harder time, I think, getting people to care about things elsewhere than you will right there where they live and the issues that they really care about. And sometimes I think just being able to connect uh, and show the dots of, well, hey, did you know that droughts could be getting worse, you know, with 
with climate change, we have science to back that up. That might be a good place, you know, to meet them if that's something that's really, you know, close to what they're thinking. Maybe part of it is, well, you know, hey, I, I work in the energy sector and I'm really worried about, you know, how we're what this means for for my industry. We'll talk about, well, look at these various companies that are all, you know, hopping in because they want to be part of the conversation. So find out what what means the most to whoever you're talking to and kind of start from there. Meet them where they're at. Thank you, uh, Brad. That kind of leads me into uh, one of the questions uh, here. It was a uh, question is, uh, what value is there in shaping a pro-climate business friendly message? Idea being to sell climate mitigation practices as green, that is dollars. Re repeat that one more time. I just, I want to yeah. think through that. Yeah, I, th I think the overall message uh, question is, you know, how do we package this up as an opportunity to sell a climate mitigation practice as green, meaning you're gonna save money if you're helping to mitigate. Well, as we certainly see like through the sustainable Tulsa, um, you know, you know, scorecard program, whatnot, I mean, it's about the triple bottom line. And, you know, in many ways, uh, being involved in making your operations more efficient and more green in many ways saves money. Uh, but also, um, particularly in the realm of what's coming down the pike, hopefully soon, kind of a more robust system to do like things like carbon crediting and things like that. I mean, we have all these various companies out there between our Microsofts and Googles and, and Walmarts and others who say, hey, I want to offset my own, you know, uh, emissions, you know, can I invest in Oklahoma in some place, you know, to be able to do that? And hopefully the answer is yes, you can. Please invest in Oklahoma. We're happy to, to help you out with your own climate uh, you know, solutions basically. Um, but I think in terms of like companies that are already here in Oklahoma looking for that, I mean, in many ways, uh, it comes down to efficiency and doing things greener maybe than you have in the past, in many ways is gonna save you money and also uh, consumers want it, the market wants it. So I, I don't see a whole lot of downside, I suppose. Yeah, and, and thank you for the plug on scorecard. Um, um, I will say, uh, since our program started, we've helped our businesses save seven million dollars on their and and that's due to their sustainability practices. And a lot of that is that waste reduction uh, approach. So there is definitely the green, uh, the dollar value here that um, you could definitely make the case for that. Uh, but it is a. a uh, also getting that message out and explaining it from that perspective. So appreciate uh, that was Chase that uh, sent that in. Appreciate that. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, Fran, uh, one of her questions, uh, you touched on carbon sequestration uh, with trees. And um, one of the questions is, you know, that doesn't, you know, they don't live forever. And sometimes there's forest fires. So there can be kind of a counter uh, problem with that. So uh, can you, yeah, uh, kind of address how trees play into carbon um, reduction? I mean, they play a huge role. Uh, and in fact, uh, TNC just got a, a very big grant, I want to say in the $10 billion level for, for Amazon help, helping to invest in, in more trees being planted. This is specifically for the, the East Coast. Um, so it wasn't anything specific to Oklahoma. Um, but seeing that, that, that trees and nature, part of those natural climate solutions is a big, big tool in the toolbox. Um, and so they get to play a very, a very big role in that. Um, obviously, what we saw with the, with the forest fires out west was devastating, and sadly, some of those forests that were supposed to be helping to absorb some of that carbon, um, you know, went up in, in smoke, and so unfortunately, that carbon goes back in the atmosphere. What's very interesting with our own local way of doing that, you know, a little bit more tied into uh, grasslands and whatnot, so think like tall grass prairie and things like that, um, if the prairie burns, which it's healthy for it to burn, it needs to burn every now and then, that's part of its natural cycle. Um, but when it burns, it stores all the carbon well down into the soil, into its roots. So when the grassland goes up in fire, uh, we don't get all, a, as much carbon going, going back on out. So in some ways, there are advantages to prairie uh, and grasslands um, soaking up carbon versus trees. Trees can do a lot more, but you know, a very important tool too are, are grasslands and that, and they don't have as much susceptibility to putting all that back out, all that all that carbon when they do burn. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. Yeah, it's uh, it, you know, again to your point, it's not just 
one simple path. There's a lot of variables that we'd have to consider in the conversation and what are the challenges. And, and um, but I guess that kind of brings me to maybe one of our last questions here. And, and of course, you've gotten a lot of uh, gratitude to your presentation. And, and I think also Fox 23 misses you. Um, I put a little post in there. But, um, you know, uh, so what, you know, I know you guys are continuing to make uh, on your work and, and uh, prepare to help us um, help us as the Oklahoma community continue these conversations and create this level of comfort in this conversation. There's very vital uh, looking at the the whiteboard that you put up there and let people you know jump in. Um, you know it is the future of our children that we're talking about right now, and so it's important that we give it the time it needs. Um, but so, what would be some of the things you would uh, recommend for 2021 to kind of help you know as people are feeling uncomfortable as we move forward, uh, either from the side of, you know, the protection of our environment or the side of business, like what's going to be expected of me? What are some of those financial pressures? You know, what kind of, what can you offer both of those communities as they're navigating how to be a part of this, as you say, you know, where we can come together and have a conversation on what's important to us? You know, what are some of the things that you see are coming up, maybe policy or opportunities? Uh, you know, there's certainly be all the opportunity for, for policy in the world going forward. Um, we're still trying to kind of hammer out exactly what that means for us here in, in, in Nature Conservancy, Oklahoma, very much using a lot of these, these, this feedback that we're getting from groups to figure out what kind of our best, our best path of, of least resistance that we think is going to be popular and whatnot. So stay tuned. That's coming probably within the next month or two. So by all means, as I think Liz Rosa is posted in there, if you want to stay up to date and whatnot, hop over to our website. We can include you in those conversations as we're getting ready to release more of that. Um, but, you know, we, we have a lot of things already that, that we're doing that, that, that we're actually leading in Oklahoma when it comes to things like climate mitigation. So for example, um, we know right now that transportation is now the largest chunk of the pie when it comes to carbon emissions in the country. It, it eclipsed power uh, generation from a couple of years ago. Uh, we happen to be a leader in, in EVs here in Oklahoma. That's super exciting. We have the third uh, largest infrastructure, most robust infrastructure for EVs in the country. How cool is that? So, you know, there's certain things that you may not think that Oklahoma would necessarily even be players in, but thinking, you know, man, we're already doing a lot of that. Maybe we should help, you know, nurse that along more. That's not to say necessarily that TNC is, is going to be, you know, uh, doing a lot in that realm necessarily. We're exploring it. Um, but there's aspects like that. Uh, and I think another thing is too, like tell, tell your leaders, tell your leaders that you want this, that this, this is important to you. Uh, if they don't hear from you, otherwise they don't think it's an issue. So talk more about climate change and saying, what is your climate plan? Um, Oklahoma City, for example, to its credit, uh, has a sustainability plan now where it has incorporated climate change and they're, they're listing it out specifically saying, we need sustainability down here because of climate change. And there has now been an effort for the city of Tulsa to say, you need to update your sustainability plan as a city uh, to have climate change listed in there too. So I, I see a lot of it, just it's just getting the conversation going and kind of friendly peer pressure of what is your plan? I think that's kind of a good way to approach it. Um, and, and we're certainly seeing more and more of that conversation happening, which is really encouraging. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I'm watching the chat as well. And, and when you mentioned the EVs, um, so it's like, where can I find that? So on NCOG and ACOG websites, uh, and a big shout out to Adrian Janes and Eric Pollard for their work to get those uh, charging stations across Oklahoma. So um, our COGs are a great resource for that kind of planning and um, healthy conversations around, uh, around these opportunities. And, you know, really, uh, you know, when you know, and that also brings up, it's the partnerships, it's the relationships that we can build with between uh, organizations, between businesses and the community, because there's, it really is going to take a whole collaboration uh, to, to work toward uh, where people can feel uh, safe and especially in an oil and gas uh, um, state uh, to feel like we can, we can do this and oil and oil and gas industry is a part of this conversation and part of the solution. And, and I'm looking forward to uh, seeing their leadership as well in, in this area. And to your point, many are posting on their site, just recently saw Williams, uh, one of our big sponsors, uh, just posted uh, their climate uh, message on their website just in the last month or so. So um, that's something that also we can start looking at is just you know seeing what some of our leading industries are saying about climate and um, understand and seeing how that that message is changing a little bit. Um, so um, 
Anyway, I think we're almost at time here. Um, Brad, thank I, you. I, yeah, I have one, one more thing real quick, just on that note, which I think is important of, and I, and I love the way this has been summed up with, with TNC of, of, we are not in the business of choosing winners or losers when it comes to energy. We are all for, for reducing emissions in any way possible. And we are continuing to have conversations both within Oklahoma and outside of Oklahoma with oil and gas and utilities figuring out, you know, what's your what's your role? You have the seat at the table to kind of figure that out. So, and that I think makes us uniquely positioned in Oklahoma to help lead on this of, of being able to have that conversation well and make it hopefully uh, a less threatening thing for sure. Yes, uh, it's only going to get better is, is what I'm hearing. And I like that. That's, that's a good message to end on here today. I, I, and I do believe that. I think uh, people are, are wanting to um, think about the future. And um, there's just so many opportunities here uh, to help uh, really look at that triple bottom line that's near and dear to us, the same with Tulsa, which is people, profit, and planet. That people is that quality of life, uh, planet, protecting those natural resources, and profit is you know, really still keeping uh, a strong economy and uh, healthy families. But we can do, but we got to do all three of these together. So um, thank you so much, Brad. Really appreciate um, your time with us and research and, and the Nature Conservancy. Uh, and thank you to everyone with all your comments and links in the, the chat as well. I think uh, we'll also, um, uh, yeah, uh, Megan just posted in there uh, about our scorecard program and kind of to respond to Chase, one of the questions there, you know, this is the way businesses can really see the green, the saving on the bottom line, uh, which is the triple bottom line here. So um, check that out, scorecard.com. Uh, Teresa, uh, who is now on our team, Teresa Kerrigan, uh, give another wave there. Uh, she's joined our team and she uh, uh, will now be leading that, our scorecard manager. So um, we will stick around for a little bit so you can say hello, but um, everyone stay healthy Healthy out there and and uh, take care of yourselves and and each other uh, your neighbors check in on them um, we also uh, want to just uh, say thank you again uh, to our sponsors and again our lead sponsor Williams and also to uh, public service company PSO and um, American Waste Control, Cavanta, the Met, One Oak, Save Our Streams, Spirit Air Assistance, TCC, McKeon Center for Creativity, and PSO Wind Choice. We couldn't do it without them or you. Uh, you're the reason we're here to have these conversations, and we hope it sparks uh, an interest and uh, furthers your research and conversations with your friends and family and colleagues. We hope to see you. Uh, first Thursday, December 3rd, and uh, we'll have an opportunity for some volunteerism as well. So stay safe out there. Stick around with us so that we, so you can say hello to each other. We'll unmic and specifically love for you to say hello to Teresa. All right. Have a good rest of the day, everyone. Take care.